My name is Sam Cook, the founder of Triathlon Research, and I'm going to be your host for today's show. We have an extra special guest today, uh, six-time Ironman world champion Mark Allen. And for any of you who have been in the sport any length of time, you uh, must have read about Mark Allen and his famous uh, uh, battles with Dave Scott, the other uh, only six-time male Ironman world champion. And uh, also, Mark was recently voted, I think, by ESPN, the top endurance sport athlete of all time, which is quite a, a prestigious honor um, given the uh, over 100 years of Olympic history and all the people that he was considered against. So uh, the topic for today's show, if you've been listening, Suzanne Atkinson, my co-host, is doing a lot of, uh, um, she's the coach and I'm not. Uh, I'm just the big fan of the triathlon as a, as a triathlete, but also just as someone interested in, in the, the role of sport in the larger life in terms of uh, society, people's personal lives and what it does for them. So what I'm gonna cover today is Mark Allen, a uh, fascinating uh, subject for me. And I, I had a chance to sit down with Mark about a month ago and do an interview for him with a project uh, on the meaning of the sport of triathlon with endurance films. And I thought it would be really interesting to bring him on the show and talk about uh, the broader uh, context of the sport of triathlon and what, how you can use triathlon to uh, improve your life overall. Um, I think you'd all agree if you've been in the sport for any length of time that can, triathlon can be tremendously uh, beneficial to you in your life, but also if you treat it the wrong way, uh, just like any drug or anything like that, uh, alcohol not in moderation, triathlon can be really destructive in your life. So I want to kind of uh, explore those different themes of triathlon with uh, Mark Allen. So Mark, uh, welcome to the show today. Great. Happy to be here with you guys. All right. So um, I just want to kind of um, leave. Uh, I'm going to give you a very open-ended question here. Um, you've started a project recently that I find fascinating. And uh, do you mind just telling the listener a little bit more about uh, your kind of your new mission and how you're using your platform and your profile uh, to help people? Well, one of the most recent projects that I've been working on is a, a book titled The Art of Competition. And the backbone of the book are 90 quotes that I that I wrote um, a number of years ago that I would say are they're not quotes about competing that are asking you to look at the numbers in your logbook or to measure anything on your uh, on your body metrics device. It's really addressing all of the human elements of comp competition, of challenge, of um finding that quiet place inside where you really do get the the big answers to the tough questions that can come up when you're in in the the midst of a race like the iron man or an adventure race or even something as simple as just a tough training day and there's 90 quotes in the book each one is they were written by me they came to me in a very uh interesting fashion that i can talk about a little bit later uh, but each of the quotes is paired with a photo from nature. And the reason that I did that is that, uh, you know, probably everybody listening has had an experience where, you know, you were at the ocean and the waves were just crashing or you 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 come through a forest and here's this beautiful lake or you're you're in the mountains in the winter and the snow on the on the peaks in front of you is just breathtaking. And when you're when you see those places in nature, when you're in them, when you're experiencing them, when you're feeling that cold wind, when you're in the in the beautiful ocean in Hawaii, you know, whatever it is, you just have that feeling like, wow, life is really good. And um, that's kind of what I, I found was the starting point for great performances in a race that I every race that I had, if I had a moment before the race where I had that feeling like, you know what, life is just really good. And I haven't even started this thing yet. When I had that as my starting point for competition for athletic performance, I was almost unbeatable, you know. And and so I wanted I wanted to try to use these quotes to inspire people to look a little deeper into into their athletic uh, life, into how they relate to that, and to to use the photos from nature to kind of spark inspiration, to you know take it to that place of 
hope and beauty and, and joy where you just go, wow, you know, I just want to go out there and just see what I can do. And then use use the intensity of that challenge to forge something really beautiful out of it. Well, Mark, that's that's amazing uh, topic. And I think that um, I, I, I had a moment in my first triathlon where right before I started the race, I was just kind of reflecting in the water um, how amazing the journey had been just to get to the starting line where I knew I was going to you know, finish the swim and, and get through the race and, and just have a transformative experience. So um, I think anyone who's completed their first triathlon might have forgotten, you know, the amazing journey they've been on and just taken the time to reflect on that. And, bef you know, so I want to come back to your book later and, and the message and what you're trying to do, but I'd like to have you go back and, and tell us how you got to that point. Because I think if I've studied your uh, career a little bit, I, I think you would be the first one to say that you didn't start out th in that place in terms of understanding what you just explained. So I think for the listener here, it'd be really instructive to, to, to have you tell uh, your background in the sport, how you got into it and, and what, what changed that got you to this point where you really started to, you know, look at the sport in, in a different way and then everything changed. Yeah, that was, that's a great question because as you said, I, I didn't get into the sport with any grand insight or really with any grand plan. I, I, I was just like probably most everybody who, or a lot of people who get, got into the sport of triathlon way back in the 1980s. Um, I had seen the Ironman on television and as I was watching these seemingly ordinary people doing this extraordinary thing, you know, the first thought I had was they are nuts. I mean, why would you want to do something that long, that grueling in, in Kona under the tropical sun with all that wind? But the more I watched it, I could just feel there was something really, really amazing, really magical going on because, you know, when ordinary, ordinary people or ordinary looking people, I should say, do, th do something that's extraordinary that you can tell is taking place because they, have, they are taking themselves to a place they've never been to before. That's inspiring. And uh, so I thought, you know what? I was a swimmer as a kid. I've got a little bit of swimming. I've got a little bit of sports background. I've never ridden a bike really, and I've never really run, but I want to give that thing a try. I want to see if I can just be one of those people to cross that amazing finish line. And that was in 1982. I went to the Ironman about six months after that, probably very, very well undertrained or overtrained for the condition that I was in when I started. But regardless, I, I had an amazing swim and came out of the water behind this guy named Dave Scott, who happened to be the first guy out of the water, which made me second. And at that point, I'm thinking, geez, you know, this, this is a pretty good sport. And um, I stayed with Dave all the way through the turnaround on the bike. Uh, and then on the way back, my dera derailleur broke. You know, we were still in the lead of the race. The, the ABC camera vans for Wide World of Sports were filming this thing. But I had to drop out. You know, after about four hours of racing, my Ironman was done. I had a mechanical failure. My derailleur broke. I couldn't shift my gears. And so, you know, right away, it was sort of like two foreshadowings of the future happened. I was having this incredibly amazing performance, for me anyway. I was with Dave Scott, who at the time was the best Ironman distance triathlete. We were in the lead, yet he went on to win. My derailleur broke. I didn't even finish. So I had this incredible wow, like, wow, look, I was with this guy for half the entire day that, that he's going to be out there. But then I had this devastating thing happen where I didn't even get to finish. You know, I had to throw my bike in the back of a guy's pickup, hitchhike back into town and, you know, with my head ha hanging low, find my family and tell them I was out of the race. But it took me... You know, year after year, I went back to Kona because that became kind of a, a quest to see if I could indeed be the champion of it. After six years of very um, grueling races where I could be in the lead but not hold it all the way, I could be on the lead halfway through the bike, at the end of the bike, halfway through the marathon, but I couldn't win the race. I couldn't beat Dave Scott there. I was beating 
him everywhere else, every other race that I was at with him, I was winning at other every other race pretty much that I went to at, at one point or another in those first six years. But there was something about the Ironman that was just, I wasn't sure if it just I wasn't right for me or if I just didn't have the right formula yet. And so in 1989, I was about ready to give up on that dream because, you know, I mean, at some point you have to say to yourself, hey, this is not realistic. I am not cut out for this particular challenge. I will not be able to achieve a certain level no matter how hard I work. But there was that voice inside that said, you need to go back until you've had your best race. Your best race may not be enough to be the champion, but you know, in the previous year, I'd had a couple flat tires. The year before that, I'd had to walk on the marathon. The year before that, I'd had to walk on the marathon. I mean, it was not my best thing. So in 1989, I, I thought I have to maybe change some things about my training, but I also have to really look at how I relate to that race because I was, I was to be honest, afraid of it. It was long, it was hot, it was windy. I knew it would require a huge amount of uh, pain and suffering. And when you want to win and you come in second, third, fifth, um, a lot of times it's hard to convince yourself that, that that suffering is worth it. I needed to go. And Mark, Mark, just I, uh, sorry to interrupt you, but you were winning all the races outside of Ironman, right? Can you, I mean, you were a top ranked triathlete beating Dave at a number of other venues. Well, at that point in my career, I'd already been named triathlete of the year once. Um, you know, people were saying, you are the best guy in the sport. However, you can't win the biggest race in your sport. So it was, <laughs> you know, I don't know what to compare it to, but it was it was just kind of a tough position to be in because everybody said, hey, you know, you, you're the best guy. You can beat everybody in short distance, half Ironman, uh, uh, you know, other long distance races like Nice. But in Kona, you melt. You're not cut out for that. And, you know, it's it's a very complex race. You have to be physically fit, but also you have to be able to go to a, a very calm place inside that says, I, I can give it, I can and I will give it everything I have, even if I come up short. I have to stay fully engaged in this. I can't be caught in a fear or doubt or nervousness that I can't do it when it starts to get tough. And I, I couldn't find that place. You know, in 1989, I, I said, I have to just go there and feel peace somehow, feel peace with the island, most importantly. And so when I went there, I just, you know, I just asked the island, I said, hey, big island, just let me just be me here. Because I can, I was calm everywhere else I raced. You know, I was, it was, it was like that nervous calm. You're nervous, but you're calm too. And in Kona, it was just, I was nervous and I was nervous. <laughs> you know, calm was not a part of anything going on. And it was a shift. You know, somehow just, I, I found this little spot next to the ocean and I sat there and I said, Big Island, let me, help me just find my, that place of calm inside somehow. And uh, there was a shift that happened. You know, somehow it, just felt like, yeah, you can, you can find that place in the middle of the race. It's not going to be easy. You're still going to have to have courage. It's not going to be uh, fun the whole way through, but you might be able to find that. And so Dave and I ended up swimming together. We ended up biking the entire bike ride. Uh, I shadowed him the whole way because I thought, you know, this guy knows how to win the thing. He'd won six already. And uh, I was, I'd won zero in six starts. This was number seven. I figured he knows how to pace it. Why go ahead of him? You know, and so we started the marathon together at about the half marathon point. He started to really put the pressure on. We we gained the lead. Nobody else was ahead of us. We were on a pace that was going to break the world's record, shatter it, completely shatter it. And one of us was going to be the one to do it, either Dave Scott winning number seven or me number one. But at that point, my my fade started to happen and you know then it was like oh no not again you know, i didn't do the right kind of training i thought i could find that peaceful place but at this moment that is not what i'm feeling and um cuz he started surging we were we were running just about a 6 minute mile pace 
and he held it and he held it. And I thought, this guy's going to run six minute pace for the closing half marathon. Nobody had ever done that before. And it completely blew my mind. I thought, I can't do it. And it, it got so hard to match his pace and not, you know, lose that one step or that one second that would just signal that my day was done. But I couldn't even hold on to the negative thoughts anymore. And my mind went quiet. And in the instant my mind went quiet, the most amazing transformation took place. And to describe it, I have to take you back two days before the race. I was in my hotel room reading, a, uh, just flipping through a magazine, passing time, not really what, look, reading or looking at anything that was in there, just trying to stay relaxed until one page did catch my attention. And it was a an advertisement for a workshop that was going to take place in Mexico, teaching about a way of life from the Indians in that area, the Huichol Indians. And that I would later learn that the Huichol Indians have a saying that says, it's not over until it's over, meaning no matter how impossible something looks to you right now, take that next step and the one after that and the one after that, because it can turn around for you. And I would also learn that the Huichol Indians value the ability to quiet their minds. They say when when we're, our minds are quiet, then we can hear the answers to the big questions we have in life. But anyway, what, what caught my attention as I was looking at this ad was the pictures that were in it of the two shamans that were going to be leading the workshop. One was a 110-year-old Huichol Indian named Don Jose, and the other was his adopted grandson, Brant Secunda. And they had a look on their face that said, I am happy just to be alive. And I that feeling is so familiar to me. It, you know, it's the way I feel when I was out training on the trails in the Colorado Rockies outside of Boulder. It's the way I felt when I was riding up the canyons there to the, the peak to peak highway, which is goes up to 9,000 feet. It's the way I felt when we climbed Mount Evans on our bike or, and uh, you know, at 14,000 feet. I mean, that feeling was familiar and they had that look in their face. And um, so anyway, back in the race, Dave Scott is holding this insane pace. My mind is going crazy with stuff that's not helping me out. And I'm sure you've all had that experience. My mind finally goes quiet because I can't even hold on to the negative stuff anymore. I had to put all my focus into just trying to stay with Dave. And in the instant my mind went quiet, Don Jose's image came back to me. And the thought crossed my mind, you know what? I bet that old guy doesn't need to win an Iron Man to feel good about his life. He's happy just to be alive. And suddenly it was like the whole thing changed. I was happy just to be in that race in this amazing place, the Big Island, with all of this lava that a second before felt like it was ready to eat me up. I looked around, I go, this is amazing. I mean, and I'm with the best guy in the world and there's still 13 miles to go. Something might change. And with that vision of Don Jose, I just felt like I was gaining all this energy, this power, you know, from him. It was just surging into my body just with that, you know, it's like a, a change in your mindset or connecting to something that that is really positive. And uh, the whole race changed, the dynamic changed. And I knew it would be just a matter of being patient. And finally, on the last long uphill before you drop down into the town of Kona with about a mile or so to go to the finish, I was able to make that uh, historic break and uh, put put a little bit of time on Dave and then a little bit more and a little bit more. And uh, finally, at the end, I held it. And he came in a mere 58 seconds behind me. He had his best Ironman that day. I think he broke his previous world's record by somewhere around 17 minutes. And I did my best time to that date by a little over 30. And again, the difference in our times, though, was a mere 58 seconds, a very, very small difference on a very large day. And, you know, I went back to uh, this is a side story. I went back to my condo after the race and, you know, my family and friends are there and they're like, wow, you know, what happened out there? How, how, how did you break Dave? I mean, what was going on? You know, because back then they didn't have the Jumbotron and, and the communication was almost non-existent. So everybody in town had no idea who was going to win until they actually saw me coming down Elite Drive. And I said, well, you know, I was 
I, I felt really good all day until about the half marathon. And then Dave really dropped it down to, you know, six minute mile and it blew my mind and I was ready to just call it quits. I can't win this thing. And then I had this vision of this Weechel shaman that I'd seen in this magazine. And, you know, they're looking at me like, whoo, this guy's flipped. You know, <laughs> you know it's a, so they're like, what happened to Mark? Yeah, it's not it's not the kind of uh, stuff you're you're expecting to hear from a guy who just won the greatest in, uh, one day sporting event ever. And uh, but and it just shows you, you know, Dave and I are are side by side. We are bumping into each other. Uh, you know, we're on the Queen K Highway, which is it's wide but neither of us wanted to give an inch. And so we kept sort of bumping into each other as we're running down this road. He's thinking about, you know, his pace and the next aid station, where he's going to break me and, you know, who knows, all this linear stuff. And I was having the, the most amazing connection to this old Weechul Indian shaman. I mean, it just shows you that so many, there's, you know, what do you want to connect to? Do you want to connect to something positive that gives you strength? Or do you want to get, you know, pulled into the negative thoughts that can ruin your race or ruin your experience or, or, or diminish the positiveness of what you are doing? And, you know, it's not necessarily the easiest thing in the heated moments of life to make that switch. But I think that is um, that's one of the reasons why people can become sort of addicted to endurance sports, because if you do a long race like that, you know, you will hit moments where you don't know if you can do it. You don't know if you can keep going. And that little voice starts up, but somehow you're able to get it to be quiet. And when that voice is quiet, then all of a sudden you are completely engaged. You are able to move at the best level that you are capable of. And that is very energizing and it's very, um, it brings a peace and a calm to your being that you, that you don't get when you're just kind of walking along and, you know, thinking about this and thinking about that. No, when you're in a race like that and you make that switch from something that's trying to talk you out of your best, your bestness, and you go to that quiet place and all of a sudden you embody the best that you can be, that is, uh, you know, you could call it kind of – similar to some kind of a like a spiritual experience or a an experience of just your personal greatness and that you know to tie it back in that's kind of what i what i try to try to do with a lot of the quotes in uh, the art of competition is to give people simple thoughts that they can maybe contemplate and use and have come back to in a tough moment so that they will take that next step into that impossibility of and uncertainty of whether that step will take them to the realization of their dream. But they'll know yeah, they'll know that it's worth taking that step, whether they make it or not. Yeah, I, I really um, I think that the you know, I, I can't wait to um, get an advanced copy of the book because it, it really I think it will um, speak to people no matter what they are. And it's, it seems like you've written this for much more than the sport of triathlon. Uh, although you're you're using your experience in the sport as a foundation, but I mean, if I was a corporate executive or um, someone in any kind of endeavor that's challenging, whether it's physical or you know political or mental or business, whatever, it, it seems like it would apply. Yeah, it's it's not written to be a, a guidebook to specifically help you be a better triathlete. It's to give you something to you know, fuel to help spur you on to be a better person, regardless of the arena or the canvas with the, where you're creating your personal art, your personal greatness, your, where you're experiencing your challenges, where you are faced with your fears and doubts. You know, it's, it's, it's talking to the heart of who we all are. You know, we all have different bodies, we all have different mindsets, but we all experience a lot of the same things. You know, we have we feel joy, we feel love, we feel happiness, we laugh. You know, every culture in the world speaks different languages, but when we laugh, it's the same language, isn't it? <laughs> a smile's a smile in any language. Yeah. So. 
And that's that's kind of where that book is written to address is the the commonality in all of us. Well, it's it's interesting you say that, Mark, because I, I travel quite a bit for um, my work. And, and just recently I've been traveling around the world and everywhere you go, a smile. I mean, you, you, there's no translation. And uh, it's it's funny that. You, you know, you say that you were looking at this old shaman Indian and, you know, he didn't speak your language natively, but it was that facial expression communicated, um, you know, really a picture's worth a thousand words, you know, probably far more than that mm. in terms of the serenity and that inner peace. And you hadn't even been to his clinic. You hadn't studied under him like I, I, I know you did later, but that one advertisement, that one image just gave you that, uh, quiet place on an iron man that's pretty amazing and, and it's it's not anything i could have planned um you know that's why i always tell people if you if you feel stuck or you feel like maybe i'm just not going down the right road you know stop reflect ask yourself if you are or not it's clearly but at the same time you know be willing to take that next step and just keep going a little bit further until until it really does become clear, you know, the steps you need to take. And for me, it took seven years and about seven hours into the race before something finally, that final piece really did click for me. Um, you know, Don Jose's image coming back to me. And then shortly after that, I went down to Mexico and, and took a re did a retreat with Brandt. And um, it was like, this is it. This is what I've been searching for since I was a little kid. You know, I knew that there had to be a sort of a, a model or a framework that that made that, that gave everything we do a little bigger sense. You know, I mean, life is not just about getting good grades in school or getting the promotion or, you know, whatever it is. You know, I've even since I was a little kid, I thought there has to be more behind this. You know, what's the what's the human thing behind everything going on here? Because I knew when I was a kid, I always felt the best when I was just outside, like in a big open field of grass or walking through the forest or down by the ocean. And I thought, what is it about this, pl these places that makes that where I feel so good. And, you know, later I would learn from Bran. He said, you know, we're just, w as human beings, we're built to connect with nature. And when we do that, that's, when we feel the best. And that's the best way to ready yourself for any great endeavor is to just go spend a little time, watch a sunrise, watch a sunset, uh, you know, sit by the ocean and listen to it for a while. Let your mind just sort of daydream. Don't worry about getting answers. The answers will come to you when you're in those kind of states. And uh, we, we actually talk a lot about that. He and I wrote a book about five years ago called Fit Soul, Fit Body nine keys to a healthier happier you and we we talk a lot about these concepts in there and and i i i tell that story about iron man and in 89 and, and then also another one of my final iron man where brant really helped me to get ready as a 37 year old to win that race Yeah, I, you know, Mark, you hit on, I think, one of the most fascinating points that you made in that, and, and you and I spoke about this last month when we uh, were doing our, our talk with an, the Endurance Films, was you have to have a pretty big ego to achieve, especially in the sport of triathlon. And I think triathlete, the, the reason the sport of triathlon is, is growing faster than any other sport, it's kind of like the new golf, um, is that it's attracting high powered people, but you hit on this paradox that in order to really transcend, you know, and hit that transformational moment in a, in any field, you actually have to let go. So it's, it's like your ego drives you to a certain point, but then at another point you have to get over it. And can you, can you kind of uh, flesh that out for me? Cause you did a wonderful job explaining that before. <laughs> I hope I can, uh, achieve that same level. Yeah, you know, I wouldn't call it ego, but I would definitely call it desire. There has to be a 
a deep, strong desire within a, a person to do the type of training to um, be the best in the world or to, to win a race, to win the Ironman. However, um, there always comes a point where, you, you know, to, to have desire, it takes a certain amount of energy. You know, if you are sitting around and you have this feeling like, okay, I, I just, I, I want to do it. And I, you know, I'm willing to do whatever it takes and I'm going to do the training. And then the race comes and, you know, no matter how hard it gets, I'm going to just hang in there and I'm going to give it everything I have. That takes a lot of energy. You know, that's very different than when somebody steps back for a moment, they take a breath, you know, you breathe in this beautiful air, you breathe out everything that you're holding on to and you're just at peace being there. And when you're in that space, you have let go of the need to become the champion. And when you've let go of that need, then you have absolutely every resource available to you to actually become that thing that you had so much desire that got you got to to that point anyway. So it is a paradox because desire gets you about 99% of the way to greatness. But that last 1% comes when you're able to just surrender and say, hey, it really doesn't matter. It really, really doesn't matter. I am going to give 1000% of what I have, but it really doesn't matter. And when you can let go like that, you, your body starts to move differently. It's more fluid. You don't have to think about going fast. You just become this thing that, that is going fast. Um, pain becomes background static. You know it's there, but it doesn't affect you. You still may have fears, doubts. Uh, you won't know if you can do it or not, but it doesn't matter. And it's so it's such a powerful place. It's really, in my opinion, truly the most powerful place to be doing any great endeavor from, because you stop thinking, you stop needing, you've stopped desiring. You just are there and you are just, it's like, it's like all of a sudden you just get plugged into the universe and you're just have all of this stuff that you have access to that you can't access when you're sitting around thinking, I want this. So it is a paradox. I hope I, I hope I explain that. It's a, well, I, I just, I mean, that it's an amazing. And when you, uh, when you and I were first speaking about this, it just really struck me that, um, and I, I've heard this in a number of different, you know, ways. So I think it was the Oracle, I think Plato or Socrates went to the Oracle of Delphi and said, you know, I've now realized I know nothing, mm. you know, like I let go. One of the smartest men in history admits that I really don't know anything, which, which really is a way of, and then the, the Oracle said, well, well now you're truly wise because it's really a way of leaping over that final, you know, we spend our whole lives trying to achieve and then, at a certain point, you have to just let go and know that you're still a great person. You know, you're still worth something, even if the result isn't where you want it to be. Mm. And, you know, if you've ever wanted something outside of sport, you can, you know, whether it's a relationship or some kind of promotion, if you try too hard, you can mess the whole thing up. And I think the same goes in athletics and, and Bobby McGee, you know, you and I both know Bobby, mm. the, the great running coach. He says your mind burns so much energy when you overwork it. Mm. And that's why when you're racing, you have to let go. Yeah, it takes energy to think. It really does. And, uh, you know, it takes, it takes recovery time to replace all the neurotransmitter things in there. And, you know, it's just like a muscle. It, gets bur it can get burned out. And, you know, that was one of the things that uh, Brant really, a lot of the techniques and teachings that he provides helped me to learn how to do is to just get into that place that was quiet. And, um, you know, I was actually at lunch today discussing this with a gentleman who was one of the fortunate folks who got into the tech industry early and cashed out. And so he's had time to think about things and he, he's, he knows my career and he's, he, uh, you know, he just, said what do you what do you think at what do you think about out there all the time you know i said i've heard you say you, you try to get into that quiet space but are you there all the time <laughs> and i said 
I said, no, you have to come back to it a thousand times in the race. You know, you'll have a few moments or a couple miles or a period where you're quiet. Everything's just clicking and you're at peace in this intense moment. And then all of a sudden you start thinking and then all of a sudden everything hurts again and you get tight and then, then you got to go back to the quiet place again. And, and you know, that's, that's just the way it goes. And another guy who, <laughs> who read uh, the previous book that Brant and I wrote, Fit Soul, Fit Body, he said, you know, I practiced that thing with the, you know, quiet in the mind and I, I really got it. And, um, you know, and I was, I was in the race and my mind was quiet and everything. He said, but my legs were still killing me. And I said, <laughs> I said, I only told you to keep your mind quiet. I never said that was going to help your legs stop hurting. You know, so it just, it just changes your relationship to those things. They don't bug you anymore. Yeah. And, and I think, um, you know, I, I was, I was, uh, and the listeners know a little bit about my story. I did triathlon a couple of years ago when I was just, you know, it was kind of a midlife thing. And a lot of people come to the sport late in life, which is a strange phenomenon. Most people quit their sports by the time they're 20, 21, 22, and, and they just kind of start a slow decline. And I think the thing that's most inspiring about triathlon and why it attracts so many people is we we don't have a lot of um, meaning or adventure in our life, I think, compared to where humans evolved and we're, we're you know, much more active uh, in prior life, whether they're working in the fields or, you know, back in the paleo days, people were hunting. And I think that triathlon really brings people back to a spirit of adventure mm. and that kind of struggle that I think is in our DNA and, our, and our, at our core that you really just don't get at the office and you don't get it at the, um, you know, life, let's face it, is getting easier and easier in Western civilization over the last hundred years. If you look at the, the, the demands that we have put on our body, even in the workplace, it's, it's much easier. Everything's getting automated. So um, I think that's why the sport is so attractive. What, what are your thoughts on, I mean, you've watched the incredible growth of triathlon, a lot of it inspired by, you know, you and Dave's uh, early uh, performances in the sport. Talk to me a little bit about what you see in terms of the growth of the sport. Yeah, it seems to have, it seems to be on a real uptick at the moment. Um, I, and I would agree that I think, you know, life has become, um, well, in a lot of ways, life has become fairly sedentary and, and very predictable. And I think there's there's something that can be said to, uh, you know, by choice, putting yourself into something that's unpredictable and just seeing what happens. There's something that's really um, enlivening about that. And, um, you know, I'm, I actually uh, wrote this quote that is going to be going on a, on a print that will be um, going out to some of the people who buy the art of competition. And uh, it says the line separating the known from the never before experience is, let me start again. The, the, line be the line separating the known from the never before experienced is where life is truly lived. And, you know, I think that line is where a lot of people go to in when they do a triathlon. They've never been there before. They've never done that. They have never done a swim bike run if it's a short race. They've Maybe they've done them in short races. They've never done an Ironman. They've never done one that fast. They've never done one in Kona, you know, whatever it is. Um, and I think it just gives people a sense of, hey, I'm alive. Yeah, it's, I think it's everyone who's done a triathlon or is even getting ready can just identify with the the feeling. And, and those, you know, really those precious moments you're, you're talking about, I know I've experienced them and, and not just in triathlon, in my former life in the army, some of the most beautiful moments I've ever experienced were really tough times, but you just look at nature and you, you look at everything around you and say, wow, this is pretty amazing. I remember in Iraq, I used to go out and watch the sunset every night mm. because it was like the one time of the day that I just was able to kind of watch nature and enjoy it and, you know, take some stress off. And I think that's how we use triathlon in a lot of ways is stressful as it is on the body, your mind can really 
unpack and unload mm -hmm. in a lot of these situations? Well, you know, if you're on a, a long ride or a, a long run, you, you get into a rhythm and in that rhythm, you are quiet. And, you know, most people train in places that are outside where it's kind of neat to look around and to see what's going on. And there's something very different about being tired from mental exhaustion, mental exertion than, than it is to be tired from physical exertion. And I, I think humans are, we're definitely hardwired to have a, a sense of feeling good when we're tired from physical exertion. I don't know if we're, I don't know if we're so hardwired to feel good when we're exhausted from mental exertion. That's usually like, oh my geez, my God, how, you know, you feel so drained some days when you've used your brain too much, but when you go out and you do a, a long workout and you just plop down on the couch, you just have that feeling like, oh, you know, you took a shower, you're clean, you're laying there, you had something to eat, your body's getting all warm because it's recovering. You know, it's just a great feeling. Well, I, I've noticed my best thoughts have always come to me while I'm exercising. Um, I've, I developed entire business plans or written articles from my blog or uh, planned all kinds of ideas on the bike. The bike seems to me to be the most inspiring place for whatever reason. But, you know, same thing when I run um, or just take a long walk, even now, um, it's, it's just an amazing place. And I, the best productivity seems to be when you're, you know, we live in a digital age where your phone's always on you. And when you get in that space where you're not interrupted, that's that's a pretty rare moment in the modern world. Well, you and Einstein, he said some of his greatest insights came while he was riding his bike, which is sort of interesting. And, uh, you know, there's, they've shown that when you're daydreaming, which is kind of what you're doing a lot of the time when you're training, that's when your mind is actually the sort of problem solving part of your mind is working at its peak. And so, you know, you want to solve a problem, go daydream. And you want to daydream, go bike. Right. <laughs> and I, I don't think people get enough of that time because we are so plugged in and dialed in. Everybody's checking their email every second when it comes in. You know, I, I have found that I have to take time and space and just go out and do stuff that is daydreaming. And that's, like you said, that's when the great insights come, the great answers to things that you have been working on for quite a while. It's great. And how do you daydream now? I, I know that you're not, um, you're, you're doing a lot of coaching, but uh, you've got a pretty interesting hobby now that allows you to daydream. Yeah, I surf every day pretty much. I live in Santa Cruz, California, right on Monterey Bay. And there's surfable surf almost every day of the year here, which is really nice. I, I just go out, I'm in the water, even if it's just for catch, catch a few waves, you know, you're, you're in the ocean. It's, it's cold here. So there's that coldness that sort of actually wakes your spirit up, even though you got a rubber wetsuit on and, you know, you're there with the ocean and you're tuning into the ocean. And, uh, I've, that's actually, uh, where some of the insights for this book came of how, how to put it together and what to do with it. The art of competition was when I was out in the water. If you want to write a book, take up cycling or surfing. Right. That's there you the, go. <laughs> the great lesson. Boy, there's so many different areas. Boy, there's so many different areas to, to apply with you. I, I think, um, I don't know if a lot of the listeners realize that you also run a coaching service and, and you've been um, in the sport for so long. I, we, we'd probably cover an entire episode just on on your thoughts on, you know, where the sport is in terms of coaching. But what's an interesting trend um, that you've seen um, in the last 10 years as, as you've watched you know, technology grow around the sport and um, the sport really grow. Um, what What's something that's really struck you that wasn't around when you were there? Well, one thing is coaches, period. You know, when I was racing, there was nobody that knew how to combine swimming, cycling, and running together into this one sport called triathlon the way the athletes did. We were the ones who were sort of going one direction and another till we figured out what was actually going to work. And so that's one thing. Another thing certainly are a lot of the tracking devices that give you information about, uh, you know, heart rate and power output and, and how many miles you actually really ran and, you know, a lot of measuring things, which it, it can work both directions for you. You know, one, it, it gives you a better reality check on what you're actually doing. Um, the other though, is that 
if you rely very heavily on your devices, there's a certain element of pace and body sensations that you may not learn about because you're so busy looking at your your whatever your your thing is telling giving you all this information so you lose some of that development of that intuitive sense of your body and you know when you're when you're in a race a lot of what happens just goes beyond the numbers you know probably every great performance that happens uh it, there's a, a transition that takes place in the race that, that went way beyond any number thing that you could have predicted. And so I, I think it's it's been a it's it's a good thing to get data information, which there's so much more available now than when I was racing. At the same time, I think it would be good for everybody to also remember you're a human being. You're not a you're not a machine. There's variables that can't be measured. You know, how how do you measure uh a good mindset you know what watch will tell you if you're psyched about training today you know what 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 piece of equipment is going to measure something as simple as your love for the sport you know these are human things that must also be developed well if anyone comes out with those devices they're going to be doing pretty well right (laughs) (laughs) you know it well, it's an interesting dichotomy there is um, uh, Bobby McGee, my friend, uh, just amazing running coach. He's he's coached in six Olympic Games, and he always told me, he said, racing, you know, the, your fitness gets you to the starting point. But but once you're in the, the top competition, it, it's it's almost all the, the mental game and, and the human spirit side of it, which to me is fascinating and especially as we were able to quantify so much more in the sport to, many times it's the athlete that just throws away the watch and 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 learns to get in touch with themselves and connect mind body spirit on a race you know and, and has developed that intuition in their training mm-hmm. that is the most successful so it's I, I think that's an amazing point you made about over measuring so many people just love to look at their data for vanity metrics or you know well i logged you know 300 miles this week well so what (laughs) you know what do you how's your life better Mm -hmm. or you know i I, i'm running this pace well are you a better person you know and, and how's triathlon contributing to that so i think it's a really you really hit on something there that i've i've noticed in the sport is there's Talk to a little bit on those lines. When can the sport become counterproductive? Well, it uh, uh, can become counterproductive in a number of ways. You know, one of the positives of the sport is is certainly the community of athletes that you come across and that you train with. And, uh, you know, those are some of the best times just, you know, instead of instead of a bar stool, you're hanging out with your buddies on a bike seat. You know, it's it's great. The community is fantastic. However, um, sometimes that the triathlon community that somebody hooks into <laughs> may have nothing to do with an athlete's spouse who's back home who doesn't like that community. You know, so it can it can be counterproductive when uh, you know the the pursuit of that athletic performance just completely takes over somebody's life who has a family, who has kids, who has a job, and they let all of these other things go just to go, you know, 10 minutes faster in the race next year. Well, is it worth it? Is it really worth it to lose a, a wife or a husband over a faster time in a race? Or, uh, I mean, there's, I'm not saying that to go faster, you're gonna lose your spouse, but sometimes people get so lost in their, in the pursuit of their athletic performance that they lose sight of the bigger picture of their life. And, I, you know, I told people all the time, I say, look, it's, this sport is there's nothing that in the immediate moment is really balanced about this sport you know when you do a five hour bike ride you know that's a that's a lot big effort on your body so you have to recover from it so you know that that's the balance you train and you recover well there's also sort of a a life recovery that goes along with it you know maybe you are really focused on a specific goal for a number of months to do this one race that really has a lot of meaning to you and then when that's done, you know, look around and ask yourself, okay, who out there 
gave up so that I could do this. Now it's time for me to put energy back into those folks. And so over the course of the of a year, let's say, try to have everything balanced. Maybe in that in season time, it's not balanced because you're not spending enough time with your kids or your, your husband or your wife. But when the season's over, spend an exorbitant amount of time with your kids, your husband, your wife, your your boyfriend, your girlfriend, your your other regular, you know, your friends. Um, so it can be it can be detrimental that way if people don't look at it and balance out the the effort that goes into it. The second thing that certainly can be very counterproductive is it is when people overtrain. You know, uh, the sport should add add to add to your quality of life. It should reduce the overall stress in your life. But if you're overtraining, doing too much speed work, doing too many miles, not recovering adding more stress to your body that's counterproductive and if you're getting injured sick burned out if at the end of the the year you don't even want to see your 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 bike or your run shoes because you you're so sick of it you know maybe you did too much so it's you know and it's a it's a tough balance to strike because peak performance requires you to go a little bit beyond during certain periods to get a little bit tired to push your body but at the same time you got to balance that out and if you don't it becomes counterproductive you get injured you get sick you get burned out you your immune system is suppressed you don't sleep as well you're cranky you're irritable you know those are not positive qualities or positive attributes that should come out of your triathlon experience but the other things like feeling great getting healthier uh thinking more clearly because your mind, you give your mind a break in those hours while you're training. Um, you know, you just feel more alive, you're happier because you're, you're not sitting all day long, you're balancing your sitting work period with these times when you're out training. That's great, that's positive, that's what it should be for. Yeah, I, th I think that's a, you know, and, and as a coach, uh, so many athletes out there like to not have a coach, I think, the type A personality of triathletes is I did it myself, you know, and this, this bootstrapping mentality that, you know, triathletes, it, it amazes me how much money they'll spend on a bike, but then comes to coaching, they won't, they won't spend any money. And I think it's a psychological thing that, you know, I'm a self-made person and, you know, it's, it's about so much more than, you know, just the performance for people. There's all kinds of psychological reasons wrapped up in why they're in the sport. And, but a coach is so valuable like you and, and, you know, my friends in in the coaching industry, Jeff Boer and Bobby McGee mm -hmm. and you know, Terry Laughlin at Total Immersion Swimming is they're able to step into your life and say, Hey, you're, you're not balanced. Like you're, you're not being a healthy person. Yeah. I think the ultimate measure of a successful triathlete is, are you showing up in those parts of your life that are not on triathlon as a better person? Mm -hmm. And, and if that's the, if you can honestly answer that question, more importantly, the people around you can say that, then, you know, rock on, you're, you're in the right spot. You're in, you're in the right sport. You're doing the right amount of training. And, you know, you might even find if you train a little bit more and achieve some goals, you're even happier. Mm. Or, and when you're there, you're, when you're there with those people around you, your quality of life is better and they see it. But when you, you know, fall down the other side and, you know, they, they notice that you're never around even when you're there and you're, you're stressed and your body's breaking down, then it's time to adjust. And I, that's why I think what you just said as a coach is so valuable for an athlete to, um, to internalize and, and maybe invest in some coaching, get some advice from people around them. Have you ever fired an athlete? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's a great question. It's, I, I wouldn't say I've ever fired an athlete, but there have been relationships that have ended mutually feeling like it's, it's just not working. And, um, you know, not everybody is coachable or not everybody wants to hear what I have to say, or sometimes it's just not the right mix, but most people who haven't liked um, the, you know, especially any of the personal coaching that I've done, it's just that they just don't want to, they're not willing to change uh, the way they do things. And I think some people come to me thinking that, gee, if I just have Mark Allen be my coach, then, this magic's going to run up, rub off and I'm going to do super, you know, but, you know, I, I tell people, look, you, you've done really well without me, but if I help you, 
you might find that you're gonna have to change some things that are not easy for you to change. Otherwise, you would have done it already. Um, so yeah, you know, we Grant and I teach a workshop also called Fit Soul Fit Body, and and we talk a lot about balance in there. And um, you know, he he says it great in relation to mate in t relation uh, to how the the Weecholes approach nature. You know, they're they don't have irrigation systems you know their their shamans do ceremonies to bring the rains at the right times of the year and stuff and he said you know the, the weechos don't wait for a drought before they do a rain ceremony they do the rain ceremony when it's meant to be done so that there never is a drought and you know he says you can relate that to any aspect of your life you know don't let yourself get so out of balance that you're you know in a proverbial drought of some sort uh you know try to maintain everything in a balanced state and then that's when you're capable of the greatest things in your life and it's you know it's a very simple concept but it's very profound if you can live that i think so many people when they reach a crisis point they're so quick to go to you know whatever spiritual tradition they might um you know whether it's go to church and go to prayer or confession or you know go to meditation if they're into that or wherever but um you know, my, my father's a minister and, and I know that, you know, everyone always says the wise spiritual minds in life that you, you always, you know, even when times are good, that's when things are most important to stay connected spiritually. Mm. And I think, I think that's a, a great point for you to, uh, to bring out in this book and the message that you're, uh, you're promoting here. So, um, but I can't wait to see it. And I know I'm going to probably get a bunch of copies of your book for people in the triathlon research community. When is the book coming out? It will be available at this point. It's looking like sometime in mid mid to late August at the very latest. Um, and I'm excited. I, I've I just received uh, a couple advanced copies, and you know when it's a it's a hardcover book. It's ten by ten. The photos are on two page spreads. There's graphic layout to it, so each one's not the same type of thing, but you know, when you open it up and you see these photos and you read these quotes, it's like, wow, I'm I'm so glad that I have stuck with it to put this thing together. You know, it's just it's very it's it's very different. It's very unique. But I think people are really going to love it. I actually sent uh, PDFs of the book to several friends when before I, you know, when I was putting it all together just to get some feedback and um I sent it to a couple of people that I, I knew would like it, and I on purpose sent it to one guy who I thought might really hate it because I thought I want to see what somebody says that is just seems like the opposite of the kind of person who would like this kind of book. And uh, I didn't hear from him. I didn't hear from him. Finally, two weeks later, uh, he calls me up and he goes, "You know, I, I got the book. I got the PDF, and I'm looking at it, and I'm." I read a quote and I read another one, read another one. Then he said, the next one, I read it. And then I started to think about it. And he said, I just, I started thinking about it. And I was thinking about it. He said it was so deep. And then I read the next one. He just said, I was only able to read about three quotes at a time because it was just, it was just completely blowing my mind apart. You know, he said, this is unbelievable stuff. So uh, I thought that was pretty cool. So what what people should do is take one quote and then do an hour bike ride, and then uh, and then when you get off the bike before your uh, transition run, then you can look at another quote. Right. It, it, um, it's it's a uh, it's mental EPO. <laughs> well, and it's it, legal. It's, <laughs> well, it just reminds me of I think my favorite quote in the world, where Voltaire said, "I'm sorry, I, I wrote such a long letter, but I didn't have time to write a short one." Mm. You know someone might look at the book and say boy this this probably didn't take that long because there's not a lot of words in there but it, you know you look at the great and i think nike you have a relationship with them just do it is three words but you know, how many millions of dollars did they spend to come up with that one and uh well it's interesting it's, yeah it's interesting because uh the gentleman who wrote the forward uh his name is jim collins who wrote good to great and built to last yeah, very successful bestsellers in the business world. And he he's a, a rock climber by passion. Um, I know him. I originally met him because his wife, Joanne Ernst, won the Ironman back in the early 80s. And um, he said, 
you know, I asked him, would you be willing to write the forward? Because I figured he knows Iron Man, he knows me, he knows performance, he knows what it takes to be great. And uh, he's an athlete himself. And he said, I'd love to. And he said, it's going to be a real challenge exactly for the same reason that you said uh, that Voltaire quote. And he, he quoted it to be actually. Uh, he said that he told me that quote and he said, it's going to be like this for me for the forward because your book doesn't have it's not 224 pages of words. There's 90 quotes. There's five chapters with text. But overall, it's very thought provoking. He said, I can't write a gigantic long forward. So it's going to take me some time because I have to write a short forward that's concise and that directly relates to this. So it was interesting. He used that exact quote when he was explaining why it was going to be so hard. Yeah. And and especially in the digital age, um, we we communicate and you know attention spans are so short these days. I mean, you could probably tweet out your book. You know, they're probably that short where you could communicate it out in tweets and really hit some people because, you know, most people think in 140 characters now. I mean, that's the limit on your text and you know, Twitter's kind of define that. So really powerful uh, communication that you've developed, I think, to speak to people in this this modern age. Well, I, you know, I, I originally thought, should I just be, you know, a purely an electronic book you know goes out for ibooks and whatever and i thought no by the time i get this thing out it'll actually be retro to have a printed book so <laughs> it's well pe people will love having a physical copy and in, in fact i was i was talking to you before you know i'd like to pre-order some copies to give out as some prizes to people on the triathlon research list and i know you know our friends eric and danny over at endurance films we did that um filming project with you, which is going to be coming out soon, um, which I'm just really looking forward to people seeing you talk about a lot of the same stuff we talked about today on, on camera, Great. because, you know, it was just so dynamic watching your eyes as you talked about that, uh, those moments. So I, I know we're working on that film and, um, you know, and, and like I tell the listener, I'm just fascinated by the, the human element of triathlon. I, I send out all these emails and a lot of people write me back with questions about coaching. And I say, well, boy, I'm not the person to ask on that, but uh, I'll, you know, I'll forward it on to my coaches that I know. Mm -hmm. But, you know, thanks so much, Mark, for um, coming on. And uh, we've got a great community here of uh, very dedicated triathletes who will probably be looking forward to seeing you on a couple webinars and live events we got uh, this summer. And um, I want to come back and, and do a podcast with you just on coaching and how, you know, some tools and things that, that you want to uh, talk about a little bit more specific to athletes on their, um, you know, whether they're self-coached or coached athletes. Uh, and then um, uh, probably, uh, I don't know, I've, I, I asked you before, maybe we can get Dave Scott on and talk about, I'd love to hear his side of what he was thinking on that race. So that's, that's fun. I've only heard him talk one time about it and it was really, uh, it's really great to hear both sides of that story because it was, you know, it wasn't me winning him getting second. It was just this truly amazing race where we both went so far beyond anything we'd ever done before because of each other. Yeah, and, and I um, I was reading, I think someone had done a sports science exercise saying that, that Dave Scott probably has come the closest to pure physical breakdown and exhaustion in an athletic performance because he was... I mean, he, he literally didn't give up on that race. His body just like broke down um, as he was finishing. They, someone did an analysis of his running cadence and said, boy, he was really reaching failure. Mm. You know, so I, I don't think there's a, a tougher guy out there mentally, um, you know, th that's raced. I know you know that because you've raced against him so many times. So He's, a, he's one tough cookie boy. <laughs> well, I, maybe we can get him on the show with you okay. or, or whatever. And um, finally, I'm going to put up a, a special page on the triathlon research site. If you want to get uh, on the waiting list uh, for Mark Allen's book, uh, get emailed as soon as it's available from triathlon research. I know that we're going to be giving away some signed copies of the book that I'm going to try and get Mark to uh, give us and that I'll just buy and, and give to people on our list for different things. Uh, so go to triathlonresearch.org, uh, triathlonresearch.org forward slash Mark Allen. And we'll just have a little waiting list page there where you can pick up, uh, drop your email in and get a advance notice when this book's out. And, and um, 
And Mark, look forward to having you back on, on a, a number of events um, uh, before and after your book comes out, because I, I just think that so many people benefit hearing uh, your many insights in the sport and really on life in general. Triathletes are a very connected and high-performing community. So uh, I think a lot of people get a lot out of your book beyond the sport. Okay. Can't wait till we're on the next time. All right, Mark. Uh, until next time, this is Sam Cook from Triathlon Research Radio, and uh, we'll see you next time. Thank you for listening to this episode of Triathlon Research. To get a full transcript of the show and all past shows, please go to triathlonresearch.org forward slash podcast. To get notified of future Triathlon Research podcast episodes, join our mailing list at triathlonresearch.org forward slash equipment to get our next show delivered straight to your email inbox. In addition, you will get our free triathlon equipment video review series from the world's best triathlon coaches, including six-time Olympic coach Bobby McKee. Tridot Systems founder Jeff Buher and Total Immersion swimming founder Terry Lachlan. So keep listening to Triathlon Research. Train smart. 